we see that bishops must be gentle, sober-minded, hospitable, and teachers. They must not be drunkards, or quarrelsome, or covetous, or greedy. They must always be very careful not to fall into the snare of the evil. Many church fathers and saints have also written about the bishop and the relationship between him and his clergy and his people. St. Ignatius the God-bearer, Bishop of Antioch, connects the bishop and Jesus Christ together in such a way that everything happens to the bishop, that everything that happens to the bishop is attributed and ascribed to Christ. In his epistle to the Magnesians, he writes, quote, For the honor, therefore, of him who desired us, it is right that we obey the bishop without hypocrisy. For a man does not merely mislead this bishop who is seen, but seeks to deceive him who is invisible. In other words, if you deceive the bishop, you are deceiving Christ. This is the way St. Ignatius saw that relationship of bishop to the people, as if you are having a relationship with Christ. Not that he is Christ, but the relationship is similar. In the epistle to the Ephesians, St. Ignatius urges them to see the bishop as the Lord himself. And it is an epistle to the Philadelphians, not the ones in Pennsylvania, but the ones in Asia Minor, he exalts the place of the bishop so highly that those who wish to be with God must be with the bishop. Again, he's writing in such a way that if you don't have things good with the bishop, you cannot have things good with Christ, with God. In his epistle again to the Magnesians, he warns against assembling illicitly without the knowledge of the bishop and causing a schism in the church. In other words, no secret meetings about the things of the church. The bishop must know everything. He is responsible for everything. And the bishop is responsible, in my case, 80 communities. His representative is the priest there, but he is responsible for all 80 communities. And so nothing should happen of any major situation without the bishop's at least knowledge. You know, we're getting ready to sell the property. Really? You said you could sell it. Maybe it's the wrong idea. Let's discuss it. That's the wrong idea. St. Ignatian warns against doing anything in the church in secret without the knowledge and blessing of the bishop. He writes this again in the epistle to the Philadelphians. St. Cyprian of Carthage, in his epistle, number 66, writes, The bishop is in the church, and the church in the bishop. And if one is not in communion with the bishop, he is not in the church. Wow. I mean, this says even more. If you're not in communion with the bishop, you're not in the church, period. You cannot not be in a good relationship with the bishop. This seems one-sided, but remember that from the bishop's side, he also has to be in good communion with the people. Okay? It's not just one direction. It's in both directions. In something known as the Apostolic Constitution, we find this. The bishop, he is the minister of the word, the guardian of knowledge, the mediator between God and you in your worship of him. God, not the bishop. He is the teacher of piety, and next after God, he is your father. He is your ruler, your governor. He is your king, your potentate. He is, next after God, your earthly God, with the little king, who ought to enjoy honor from you. For let the bishop preside over you as one honored with the dignity of God, which he is to exercise over the clergy, and by which he is to govern all the people. Think about these words. Teach Father, ruler, governor, king, potentate. This is what Cyprian, what the Apostolic Constitution said about the bishop. 
Now, if you're going to be king, you better be a good king because the people will revolt. Right? I mean, we see this in history all the time. As long as we're happy with the king, no problem. In America, there was an issue with the king of England. <laughs> we revolted. If he had taken care of his people in America, there would have been no revolution, no need. And so if the bishop knows what's good for him, he will serve well the people. If he doesn't, and if he loses his mind and goes against the people in some kind of crazy way, he will pay the price. The people will revolt. And then you have real problems. Because it's not so easy to get rid of a bitch. Really, it's not. He's got to die. <laughs> God willing, I don't go anywhere for a long time. <laughs> Only because I want to see the pirates fleeing many times. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the second year of playoffs. This is my second year here. Try to figure out why we keep winning. <laughs> By the way, as a Pirates fan, since the age of six, this December I will be 56 years old. I've been pulling for the Pirates for 50 years. I have suffered for 20 years. <laughs> so I'm like you. In addition to the writings of the Church Fathers, there are various canons of the church concerning the bishop. Here are three examples. For the clergy, the 39th apostolic canon states, let the presbyters and deacons not carry out anything without the knowledge of the bishop. In other words, the deacons and the priests in the community should not do something out of the ordinary without the bishop's knowledge and approval. I can say most of our priests follow this direction. There are a few remedies. I will get them. <laughs> <laughs> the 35th Apostolic Canon deposes a clergyman who insults the bishop. So if there's a priest who insults his bishop, a bishop it says, but his bishop, he's to be deposed. He's to be laid aside. He's to be defrocked. He is to be no longer the priest if he insults his vision. If we applied that one, I will not discuss it. <laughs> a lay person, it says, is to be anathematized if he or she strikes a vision, according to the third canon of the Synod of Aeneas Sophia. Aeneas Sophia is the church in Constantinople. So if you hit a vision, you can be anathematized. Think about that. Now, I'd make an exception. At summer camp, if a kid wants to hit me, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but none of them have tried it. <laughs> Am I correct? <laughs> yes, I'm talking about you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I served for six years as a priest prior to my consecration in Furman as a hierarch under the old forion of his eminence metropolitan Alexis of Atlanta. That metropolis covers eight states of the South. North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and the eastern third of Tennessee. That was the area that I was responsible for as the itinerary preacher and professor for five years. Working with him, I saw up close the joys and triumphs, as well as the sorrows and disappointments of the life of the hierarchy. You are constantly on the go. The only way to be with your people is to visit them. And so nearly every weekend of the year you travel to one or more of your parishes in your metropolis of your diocese. He used to say this to me. In fact, Father, we work the first hundred years of our lives. We rest the second hundred years. <laughs> That's the life of the bishop and the clergy. Maybe the pastoral visit is to celebrate the feast day of the community. Maybe a convention or a retreat is being hosted by that particular parent. Maybe there's an ordination of a recent graduate from the theological school or seminary and he's going to be there, of course. 
Maybe the bishop is coming to celebrate a baptism or a marriage. Maybe there's a new church that's being consecrated. Maybe it's a significant milestone in the community's life. 50, 75, 100 anniversary of the community. Maybe a priest is celebrating 25 years of the clergyman or 50 years of the clergyman. Or maybe a long-time priest has fallen asleep in the ward, and the bishop is coming to preside at the funeral to comfort the people. The administrative responsibilities are quite significant in number when overseeing the activities of the clergy and the laity in the communities. Of course, the bishop is assisted by his chancellor in many things. But ultimately, the bishop makes the final decisions, which sometimes can be very difficult. As they say, sometimes it's very lonely at the time. I've known several bishops of the church. The first hierarch I remember in my early life as an acolyte, about his age, yes, your age, <laughs> was his eminence Archbishop Iacobus of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese when he visited my home parish in Charlotte, North Carolina. I watched how he was always in command when celebrating the services and how there was a presence to him. He and other hierarchs served as role models for those considering the priesthood. Never, never did I dream that one day I might join their ranks in the years to come. At Holy Cross School of Theology in Brookline, Massachusetts, where I went to seminary, we of course studied what it was to be a deacon. But until you're ordained and standing before the altar next to the priest or the hierarch, you just do not know what it means to be a deacon. And of course we studied what it meant to be a priest. But again, until you're ordained and standing in front of the holy altar leading services, you just do not know. We also studied about bishops, although I doubt many of many of any of the seminarians thought about the possibility for themselves. I know that I for sure did not consider the possibility. But now following my consecration and in standing in front of the altar as a hierarch, I know. It is an unbelievable feeling of awe, and at times a feeling of unworthiness. You seminarians, listen carefully. The unworthiness feeling will never leave you. But you have to be. And you have to be known. My brother hierarchs, of course, know what I'm talking about. It is an unreal sensation, something indescribable. Let me conclude by saying <coughs> that you can see that the relationship between the bishop and the priest and his people should be a special one. The bishop holds an awesome responsibility for the people that he has received to oversee. In fact, he is responsible for all their souls. In my case, about 10,000 of their beloved souls. The relationship should be like a beautiful marriage where there is love and respect and it is mutually expressed by both. I thank you for your attention.